G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. Uh, things look a little different this week. Igor and Paul are out shooting, so I've had to sort out the podcast all by myself. Uh, as always, we've got Scott and James here in the one shot this week. Yeah, we're looking guys? directly at you in, as opposed to sort of offset to you this yes, week. Yes, we've changed it up a little bit. We'll see how it goes. If you like the new setup, uh, write to us, podcast at carexpert.com.au and express how much you enjoy it or don't enjoy it. We're open to any feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, it's good to be back again. It's been a couple of weeks since I've seen you. Yeah, uh, how was your big trip to the States? I was great. I did a week of filming with Paul and then I took a week off to have a little bit of a, a break. And Which part of that was great, just to be clear, the break or the filming with Paul? <laughs> For the sake of my job, I'm going to say both. Uh, oh, well done. Yes. Good answer. You live another week. <laughs> yes. No, it was great. I went up uh, to Yosemite National Park and it snowed. I got stuck in a snowstorm. It was, yeah, it was really fun. I had a really good time. And what were you driving? Because I know you rented a car when you were over there. Yeah. So after I finished with Paul, I actually ended up renting a Chevy Suburban for a week. Which Big was, boy. Uh, yeah. It was only the baby engine. It was only the 5.3 litre oh, V8. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, God, that, they, they should sell that here. That thing is epic. It is just so much space, so much more room than a Land Cruiser, so much more comfortable. Like, yeah. We're, we're going to get the, is it the GMC Tahoe? We're getting the Yukon. We're getting the, Yukon. The, Yukon. The, the, the Tahoe's the Chevrolet one. Yeah, the right. Chevrolet, it's okay. the small Suburban. So the, the Yukon is like the Suburban, but nicer. Luxurious GMC yes. Suburban. Nicer leather. And yeah. we're not sure whether we're getting the XL one, which I think is much similar to the Suburban. And then there's a standard size one, which is the Tahoe. It's like, yeah, yeah the the badge engineering stuff that they do over there is really interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that'll be a really interesting addition to the Australian market, I think, because we've seen that like the trucks or the pickups mm. do really well. Um, adding the extra capability of the seats and you know um, all that kind of thing. They're, they're meant to be quite cool cars, so I wonder if we'll see a lot of them yeah. on the road here when they release them. Yeah, and I think like driving around in the Suburban, it doesn't, it doesn't feel bigger than a Land Cruiser. Like it's not really that much wider, I don't think. It's definitely longer, but I mean, it's no longer than driving a high ace or something like that. Right. So. It's also worth bearing in mind you were driving it on, you know, roads through the national park mm. in Yosemite. It's not as if you were driving it around the middle of downtown European cities. Mm. So when you get to the States and you drive on the interstate and you're in those big cars, they feel right at home. And it's the same thing here. If you live in the country, it doesn't matter how big they are because you're towing a horse float or something with it, you've got space. I think that's a, a, an interesting point because we hear a lot of people complain on socials and in comments about, oh, they're too big for the roads. But like, guys, there's trucks on the road. Like, yeah. a truck weighs 60 tonnes, so I think a, a, a Chevy pickup or a Chevy Suburban, it's not really a problem for our roads. No, as long as you're using it for what it's meant to be used for. Absolutely. Yeah. Two people driving through the American countryside is exactly what a Chevy Suburban's meant for. Sure, <laughs> two or more people even, <laughs> yes. but hey. But it did fit all of our bags. Like, we had our big suitcases, I had all my camera kit, and, and there was room in the back with all three rows up. Like, it's just... That's incredible. It's amazing. The space in there is phenomenal. But um, we're not going to talk too much more about the Chevy Suburban. <laughs> yeah, we got off track, sorry. We can't buy, but what we are going to talk about this week is VFAX, because we, uh, I know it's the 19th of February now. Normally we talk about this earlier on in the month, but because we haven't been here, we're just getting to it now. And it was quite a big uh, big start to the year, guys. So 89,782 new cars delivered in January, which is, I think it's the biggest we've had in about six or seven years, the biggest January we've had in a while. It's, um, it's interesting. It's a big month, but everything we're hearing says it's going to get tougher. And I know that we've been talking about this the last couple of months now on VFACTS. Um, even when they announce these big numbers, the FCAI, which puts them together, and all the car makers have said, yeah, yeah, this is a good month, but just beware that it's still not real. It's still historical demand. And that sort of played out in the fact there's a lot of hybrids, for example. People have been waiting a long time for Toyotas are finally getting their cars. So although January was big, we're not necessarily expecting that to continue. Mm. And before we dive into the numbers, um, we did have a comment after our Q&A a couple of weeks ago uh, where we talked about wait times coming down on Toyota products. Uh, one gentleman, Benny, on YouTube left us a comment saying that his partner purchased a Lexus NX 350H Sport Luxury with Enhancement Pack 1 uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the 3rd of March 2022, which is wow, two years so ago. Uh, they were told an eight to nine month wait and they're still waiting. Uh, and they were offered to go a different spec for more money and they're like, no, no, we'll just we'll just wait it out. But like that's two years a long time to wait for it's a very long entry time. level Lexus. Like people are are being faced with this dilemma, right? I know Kia, Hyundai, it's it's similar and of course Toyota as well. There are certain specs that are just really hard to get. So over at Kia, if you want a jungle green diesel sportage, for example, you have to wait quite a long time. But the dealer might offer you a black one with a petrol engine and I know a lot of people are quite pragmatic and willing to switch, but if you've got your heart set on something and that Lexus is not a cheap car, you've really worked hard to get to the point where you can order it. 
I can understand why you'd want to wait, even if two years is a very long time. Yeah, I think something to bear in mind as well is that we obviously, I think this comment was also in response to us talking about wait times specifically coming down across the range because there was a, uh, an array of models that had really extended wait times for a long time. And the problem is as well is that we can only go by what the manufacturers tell us. And so there may be a point where they say NXs are coming down with their wait times, but things change all the time. There, there were plenty of um, cases throughout the last couple of years where brands would tell us that one day they knew something or the ship had left the dock and then Three days later, they get a, an, a notification to say it's been delayed or something like that. The and then it pushes on board or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and that's the unfortunate reality. It just constantly changes. So we can only tell the public what we know, but unfortunately, it may not always be the case once you get to the dealer or if you've already ordered your car. So it's just an unfortunate thing. Mm. Well, I mean, it's not slowing Toyota down, though, because they did win the month again. Uh, they had the most cars by a fair margin, I think, by nearly 8,000 cars delivered. Pretty standard for Toyota Australia. When was the last time they didn't win the month? I, <laughs> That's yeah. what I want to know. It's a very good question. It's probably back in the days when uh, Falcons and Commodores were roaming. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So it was a while ago. Um, but Ranger was number one again uh, in terms of individual models. They had 4,747 uh, 4, deliveries. Um, Hilux 4,092 and D-Max coming in third with 2,541. So not bad for D-Max. So with the Hilux, we are expecting the mild hybrid, the 48 volt facelifted version to touch down in dealerships next month. It's not unusual for at the end of a model's life cycle or as an update comes, there to be a couple of down months. And the Hilux is such a high demand car, it's slightly different, but it wouldn't surprise me if Toyota now has people starting to order the updated version. And because of that, its number was down a little bit for last month. So. I know the Ranger won uh, 2023. It started off this year really strongly. Let's just wait and see come March, April, May, as that new Hilux starts rolling out, what that looks like. Because as Ford's supply maybe wavers or there's sort of a gap between shipments and Toyota's new model arrives, I think that race is going to be very close again this year. And Hilux, I guess it's not a new model per se, but it is. there is an update to it. So yeah. they've, they've changed a bit of the design and stuff, haven't they, James? Very, very mildly. Yeah. <laughs> no. Just like the hybrid. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, so, and some very minor spec adjustments. I think the headline act is the fact that that mild hybrid diesel is now arriving. And if you're playing at home, that's also the engine that's going to be in the new Prado. So it'll be our first look at like what how that performs. And it'll be really interesting to see what consumer feedback is around how that goes with having the idle stop start system but the mild hybrid should probably shut it off earlier and whether that there's it plays into any of the capabilities of the car or just the daily usability so um that's a pretty big thing because there's not really much hybridization in the ute segment and even though this is very mild by hybrid standards it's um still a fairly big development mm. well it'll be interesting to see when uh the ranger plug-in hybrid arrives how that competes with it i suppose and how many people are willing to jump on that bandwagon? Uh, the following on from the three uh, top three models being Utes, it was Rav4, Outlander, and MGZS were the next three. So, so SUVs. Yeah, it shows how long of SUVs isn't dying down anytime soon, is it? But interesting the um, the models there because the Rav is you know five seater, probably a lot of hybrids being delivered with that because of long waits and orders. Uh, Outlander, typically a seven seat, is the one that, that seems to be the, the popular variant? Uh, not necessarily. They offer fewer seven seaters than they do five seaters, but it is definitely a draw card for that car because so few rivals have a seven seat option. And then the ZS, which is a tiny little SUV, but I guess it, it's um, it's just good value. That's what people are looking at at the moment, the isn't it? Other thing with ZS, and this is sort of a quirk in how the numbers are reported, is the ZS isn't just the ZS. It's also the really cheap ZS, it's the ZST, and it's the ZS Electric. So across those three models, I mean, it's not all that different to the Outlander where there's 18 different variants or whatever it is, but that ZS number is a sort of an amalgamation of three very different cars. Yeah, right, and so uh, rounding out the top 10, Toyota, 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 but the interesting one from the Toyotas <laughs> was um, the Prado uh, ninth, which it's still like, that thing is so old, there's a new one coming, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down sales at all because they delivered 1,749 Prados this month. I thought January. you were going with like, a, that thing is so old it knew the dinosaurs or something. They probably did, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, people still want them. I mean, it's still a very popular car and again, we, we've seen wait times on them. So I suppose if you're Toyota, it's a pretty ideal situation. You can just keep delivering the old one right up until the new one arrives and then ramp it up again. Now, EVs, EVs are an interesting one. I want to talk about this for a second because we've seen EV growth go through the roof, uh, especially towards the end of last year, but it seems to have tapered a little bit. The funny thing is Tesla uh, didn't win this month, though. It didn't win in January. There you go. It was actually BYD. Um, uh, so it was, uh, BYD did 1,310 deliveries. Tesla, 1,107. Now, we know Tesla have some delay issues and 
probably focusing on cyber trucks, which they probably shouldn't be, but they so are. For context on Tesla, we talked about this, I think a couple of weeks ago, but the Model 3 in Australia um, didn't meet Australian design rules. So this new Model 3 that people have been waiting to get their hands on, Tesla have been waiting to deliver, had to stop sale while they worked out how to put an accessible center rear seat, top tether for a child seat in there. So between that and then a boat being sent back because there was issues with that shipment, uh, that Tesla number is a, a very compromised number. But the interesting thing was, yeah, BYD, uh, fairly new to the market. Mm. Seal being the most popular, it only just came out. But the Auto 3 has been around for two years and they sold 400, or delivered 465 cars. Now, I'm, that sort of amazes me because that's not a new car anymore. That's been around for a while. So what do you, what do you guys think is the, the reason so many people are jumping in Auto 3s at the moment? The right car at the right price. I mean, you you look at uh, the options around that price, and the ZS EV is, is good, but it doesn't feel as polished as an Auto 3. And then you also can go cheaper, but then you're looking at a smaller BYD Dolphin or an MG4. Um, the Auto 3, I don't think it's quite as good as a Model Y or a Model 3, but it's also 10, 15 grand cheaper, and you can get one quickly, you can get a couple of different colour options. It all sounds like basic stuff, but just an easy solution to the problem of people wanting an affordable SUV. And what about you, James? Where do you stand on the Auto 3? Well, the, the, it's hard to go anywhere these days without seeing them. I see them very, very regularly. Um, they look good. I think people are really interested. You know, they saw the, before they got rid of the badge at the back that said, build your dreams, everyone, <laughs> yeah. you know, I get questions about it all the time. So people are obviously really taken by the design and really interested in it. A lot of people are looking into moving to a, an electric vehicle, but are quite scared off by the really expensive stuff. Some people might not like Teslas because everyone's got one. Um, and, you know, it's like Scott said, it's a really good size. It's well priced. Um, it definitely looks a lot newer and more cool than an MG ZS EV. And, you know, I think they're just doing, BWD is just doing a really good job at, you know, offering products that look good, are affordable, and getting people into electric vehicles for their first taste of it. Because a lot of the time, it probably is their first try at an electric car. The, one of the ones that really surprised me, and I'll get to what I'll ask you guys what surprised you soon, but Alfa Romeo had the second biggest increase in terms of sales percentage, 224% increase <laughs> month on month. Now, Alfa Romeo don't sell many cars. They don't have many cars in their lineup. But what do you think that suddenly caused them to jump up the charts a little bit there? Uh, if I had to guess, it would be the Tonale plug-in hybrid. Uh, it's just touched down in Australia, and obviously they've started delivering them. Um, when you are a small brand like Alpha, new product is obviously really important because the stuff that's been here for a while we know is selling at the rate it's selling. But the Tonale Fev is a totally new buyer. It's a totally new group of people for Alpha, and it's totally new tech, and I think that's obviously going to help them. Whether it's sustained over the year, I don't know, but... It's certainly the first bit of really good news in that Alfa Romeo office in Australia in a little while. Yeah, so it's a bit of that new car fever. Everyone's excited about the new the new toy that's out yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What, so, okay, that's my that's what surprised me this month. But what surprised you guys this month in terms of cars that jumped out at you that you surprised they sold a lot or that didn't sell as well as you thought were? Oh, James, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think one thing that um, surprised me, and this sort of goes back to what we were talking about before, was that Toyota had 34% growth or something to that effect. I know that um, supply has been a really big issue for them, and they've already talked about how throughout the course of this year things will get better. Um, the fact that it, they delivered on that and have increased their um, monthly sales by so much is interesting, and it means that you know we get a lot of commentary around whether Toyota's relevant anymore, which I find a bit funny given they're, you know, market leader. Continue they, to be dominant. Yeah, yeah, how many cars they have in the top 10 overall. And I think what Toyota does has done really well is, you know, they've got a very strong brand. Their, their stuff just works. And I think, you know, you, a lot of people are still really interested in their cars. So um, I'll be interested to see how that goes for the rest of the year, given last year they didn't struggle, but they, were, they did lose some share to some of the other brands. Now that things are starting to even out a little bit, will they maintain or extend their lead over the rest of the market, especially with all the regulatory things coming in now with like electrification and emission standards, fuel quality. It's all going to be really interesting next 12 months. And what about you, Scott? What jumped out at you this month? Uh, nothing to do with regulations or fuel quality <laughs> or emissions. 22 Chevrolet Corvette Stingrays were delivered last month. Yeah, and the 22. new ones haven't been here yet. So there's yeah. six. So uh, I don't know whether that's just pent up demand and they've finally been delivered to Oz or whether 22 people decided that new year, new me, midlife crisis, it's time for a Corvette. 
Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing, hopefully, at least some of those on the roads around Melbourne because it's a really good-looking sports car and it's a bit different to a 911. Yeah, well, so if you're a 45 to 55-year-old male and you just bought a Corvette, write to us. Yes. We'd love to know why. Yes. Uh, okay, well, uh, guys, just to remind you, our Ampole fuel comp is still running. Uh, it's very simple to enter. You've just got to take a photo of your car with Ampole in the background. Please don't take a picture at the Bowser. That's a terrible idea. No phones <laughs> at the Bowser. Uh, but it's very simple. You uh, take a photo of your car because we want to see your cars Ampole in the background, and then tag us on Instagram at carexpert.com.au. Use the hashtag Ampole Fuel Comp, and uh, you can win a $200 fuel voucher. It's pretty easy money, right? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I mean, you guys would go out, but you can't win it because I won't give, give you the award. But um, <laughs> all we can do is try. Feel free to answer if you like. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we're keeping it a bit shorter this week, but we're going to jump straight into our review car this week. And um, well, it's, it's cool, but it's also kind of sad. Um, he went but, up in pitch a little bit yeah, just there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit sad. Uh, the V8 is dead. Long yeah. live the V8. Uh, the new C63 SE Performance yes. from AMG. Yes. Scott has been driving it. I have. Let's um, tear the bandaid off. Scott, tell us about it. Oh, well, it's not a V8, just in case you didn't get that from Sean's intro. Um, it's a very, very different car. The C63 has always been this kind of German muscle car. I mean, the last one you would start it and this massive burble from the engine had ripped through and windows would start shaking. Uh, you press the start button in this new C63 and you get nothing because it's a plug-in hybrid. So Mercedes has paired the four-cylinder engine from the A45 with an electric motor and a lithium-ion battery. It's quite small by plug-in hybrid standards. It's good for a limited, it's about, uh, I believe, about 15 k's of electric-only range, but that's because Merck is actually designed to be a performance add-on rather than an emissions add-on. Um, it's got some pretty crazy numbers. So with the four-cylinder engine, the electric motor, and then the electric compressor for the turbocharger, which is meant to cut lag, all working together, it's got 500 kilowatts and more than 1,000 newton metres of torque. So what was the old V8? The V8 was under 400 kilowatts, wasn't uh, it? I believe the V8 was about 380 and about 650 or 700 newton metres, right, something so like that. Fairly but, solid jump. Oh, huge <laughs> jump. Um, it's a very different car though in a lot of ways beyond just the engine. The old V8 was, for one, very noisy, but it was very thirsty. It was quite rough riding. Even after an update to that last C63, it kind of felt a bit busy all the time on suburban roads because it just was kind of angry and like a sort of... Like a muscle car. Like a muscle car, yeah. <laughs> uh, the new C63, when you put it in comfort mode, defaults to electric power, so it's very quiet. It's got a very impressive, comfortable ride where you could genuinely drive it daily and not worry about it. And it's, it's just an easier thing to live with in general based on our first drive of the thing in Tasmania. Um, put your foot down and it's, it's really impressive. Uh, even in comfort mode with all of the engine and stuff turned off, when you accelerate, in some plug-in hybrids, it's really awkward. You get sort of electric motor and then the gearbox and the engine kick in and there's this awkward jolt. In the C63, it kind of feels like you've got the hand of God pushing you along as it works it all out. So you start accelerating and the electric motor already is doing its thing and you sort of feel a bit more of a shove in the back. And the petrol engine kicks in and the turbo starts singing and all of a sudden you're doing 30 or 40 k's an hour quicker than you expected and it's not made much noise or made much of a fuss. It is so fast. Hmm. Uh, it, it, it is, but it still feels kind of... Now, uh, don't get me wrong, because that A45 engine is unbelievable. Yeah. That is such a cool... Thing. But it's in a hatchback, and so you're yeah, like, oh, it's absolutely. super hot hatch. Um, I, I understand what you're saying. It feels really powerful. It feels really, does it feel like something's missing? Like, if you had owned an old C63 with a V8, does it feel like something's a little bit missing and wrong? Yeah, it does. Um, I'm wary of saying this one sucks because it's not the old one. And I feel like in the car world, we do that sometimes. We're very quick to write off new ideas because we don't like them the way we like the old ones. If you bought the old C63 because you want to do laps up and down Chapel Street late at night, revving your engine, I assume because you think that's really attractive to strangers, uh, you're not going to like the new one. The four cylinder doesn't sound nearly as good when you're going hard. It still sounds sort of purposeful, but it's not a lovely warm V8 noise. Um, but if you want a proper M3 rival, the sort of car that will really demolish a road in the way the all-wheel drive M3 will, or to a lesser extent an Audi RS4, because that's not quite as special, I don't think, the C63, the new one really excels. Uh, it is really heavy. It, it weighs almost as much as the X-Class Ute. So it's, um, yeah, it's over two tonnes. It's more than it? two tonnes. Yeah. But you put it in its angriest sort of settings, and there's a lot of those to play around with, 
and it feels like a giant A45. It's got a very clever all-wheel drive system. It's capable of using the motor or a proper limited slip diff to then fiddle around with what power's being put down where. And with the suspension in its stiffer motor, it controls its weight really well. And in the old one, you always felt like you were kind of wrestling it. You sort of put your foot down and you were managing traction at the back. It was busy, it was quite firm. It was really good fun, but it wasn't necessarily the quickest way to get to where you were going. The new one isn't the same kind of fun, but it sort of take your breath away fast on, on a twisty road. And it, it feels like a different interpretation of the kind of like grown up rally car feeling you get from an all wheel drive M3. Now, James, I'm curious as your thoughts because you're far less bogan than Scott and I are. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is more to your liking, but, but what do you think of it now? No more V8, just the four-cylinder yeah, hybrid. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an in really interesting concept because, you know, Mercedes is basically, or Mercedes AMG specifically, has taken their perhaps most successful or most loved model mm. and completely changed it. Like, you know, imagine if, uh, I can't think of another brand, like, you know, Toyota just changed the Rev4 hybrid and completely, you know, did it and went or the opposite Ford made way. an electric Mustang. Mm. SUV. <laughs> <laughs> just an example. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I just pulled that out of the air. Yeah, but like an actual electric Mustang, though. Like, it, it's it's a very big step change, and I think what the when you read the details of the drivetrain and how it all comes together, it's very very interesting. It sounds really cool on paper, and as Scott's described, it's got a very very different feel to it. But you know, I've I did the international launch of the C43 over in Europe, and you know that car went from a, a V6 to a four cylinder. And it's the same four cylinder that's in this C63. And while, like Scott said, it's, you know, it sounds purposeful enough, it's still very quick, it's, you know, the lag's really been cut out. It, it, for me, it was just like, you know, this is a, for the C63, it's like a $200,000 super sedan. We don't even get the wagon, which is another thing that I complain about, but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's for another day. But, you know, it's this really, it, and it looks boss, it's like, it's fat, it's chunky, sort of like, it looks like a C63, but then you, yeah, you sort of get out, out there and then, you know, I feel like you'd probably feel like the four cylinder just doesn't have enough like muscle to it. It's almost like when you meet someone that's had like cosmetic implants or something <laughs> where it's like not, like you, you want something that's yeah. more substantial. It's just, a bit of meat, yeah. It yeah. delivers the way it performs really differently. Yeah. Like you, you drive that V8 or even the old V6 and from low revs, you put your foot down and there's just this effortless kind of surge you get from them. And the four cylinders got very similar outputs to that old six mm -hmm. in the C43. Or, I mean, we've got more power in this new C63, but they work in a different way to get there. And you've just got to adjust to the way they, they deliver that performance. I think the other part of that too as well though is that AMGs have been known for being big, loud, Mm. Brutes, and so this is a complete rebrand of what AMG and what C63 really stands for. I know it's polarizing; it's probably got them great coverage, a lot of you know in-depth discussions like we're having right now. I need to spend some time with it properly to see how I take it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely very interesting. I'll probably reserve my ju judgment for a proper drive. But like, yeah, I I personally would sort of be hanging out for that CLE 53 that's coming out, yes. which is like the new C-Class Coupe thing, which sort of keeps a bigger block in there. And I love the sound of that inline six, but it's obviously nowhere near as fast as the C63. So it'll be, uh, I'm really interested to have a steer of it and see what it feels like. So one question I have that, that, that threw me a little bit, the C63 only has a 51 liter fuel tank. I, now, did I read that wrong or is that actually... I believe you read that correctly. And, and I think this comes to a bigger conversation about this car. Um, I am slightly worried that it's going to be an orphan. And I say that because of the way that it's all put together, right? There's a really complex plug-in hybrid system. The battery is under the rear seat and boot and there's a big hump in the boot, so the boot space is limited. I worry that the next generation of this, whether it's fully electric or whether it's a more refined plug-in hybrid, is going to make this look really first generation and kind of average very quickly. And I would imagine that fuel tank is small because of the packaging, right? There's now on the rear axle, there's an electric motor, there's extra differential stuff going on. There's a battery, there's high voltage electronics. There's a lot of cooling for the battery as well. I would just imagine there's no space for the same size fuel tank you get in, you know, an M3, for example. Um, I wonder as well beyond that though, whether when the next one comes out with a flat boot floor, with a better package rear axle, with a different fuel tank, or even when the next one's fully electric. I, I don't know what it looks like. I feel like there are so many cool ideas in this car, but because of where we're at in the development of just performance tech in general, I worry it could be made to look 
very, I suppose, experimental very quickly and whether it's going to be an awkward in between or like the Polestar 1, for example, which is a plug-in hybrid that now has been usurped by fully electric stuff. Um, we're kind of at a tipping point. I don't know what it looks like, the future, but it seems to me like while I could, or I can, I'd be getting in on an internal combustion super sports car like an M3 or an Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio, which is just a brilliant or, car. <laughs> until it breaks down, but yes. Or, <laughs> yeah, unrelated. Or jumping to something fully electric. Because I wonder if in five or 10 years time when it comes time to try to sell or buy one of these, what the market looks like for the bridging tech that Mercedes has used. Mm. And I think that's a really good point because resale is something we hear a lot about in our comment sections and letters and stuff that people write to us, or emails, not letters, it's 2024. But um, <laughs> yeah, the, I, I imagine the, the resale value of the V8s are probably gonna climb quite a lot now because like uh, when the Commodore went, yeah. went uh, four cylinder and V6, it, the V8s just went through the roof. Do you think that's gonna be a similar thing here? People are gonna wanna hang on to the V8s, gonna wanna hang on to what the, the ethos of a C63 is all about? Uh, I, I think yes, but I'm also not stupid enough to think I know anything yeah. about what people are gonna do with their yeah. money. So uh, looking into the crystal ball is always challenging, obviously. Yeah, I think there's definitely gonna be extra demand for that old C63, especially as the world goes more electric. It sort of feels like a big middle finger to that because it's so loud and burbly and V80-y. Um, but it's worth remembering that Merck sold a lot of them. Like over the years, it's been a very popular car for AMG in Australia. It's, it's still fairly common in the context of those cars. So I don't think values are gonna skyrocket in the way they have on old 911s, for example, because there's still enough of them around that you can sort of shop people against each other. Now, the interesting thing is, and I, I remember Mercedes have said this in the past, that the C63 was one of their biggest sellers in Australia. People love the top spec, they love the V8. The new one is around $190,000 starting mm -hmm. price. I understand you haven't driven the C43, yep. you haven't driven the C63, but I'm curious, your money on the table, would you spend more on the C63 or would you say the, the C43 is probably better all-round package? I'd buy an M3 Touring. Okay, that's um, <laughs> I mean, yes. No. <laughs> for me, uh, I have a lot of interest in the plug-in hybrid tech and I have a lot of respect as well for the fact that Merck pulled it off because I've driven a BMW XM, which is also a performance plug-in hybrid and... But that weighs a thousand tons and looks terrible. Well, it's not that much heavier really than the C63, but it just feels disjointed in a way the C63 doesn't. It's the most impressive performance FEV or FEV I've ever driven. But I think for what I want from my performance car, I don't want to be thinking about all that stuff. I think I like the idea more of the C43 or, or even a regular C-Class, to be honest. Um, yeah. I don't know that I want my performance car, and this is a personal thing, it's not like the, the plug-in hybrid doesn't work. I don't know that I, I want a performance plug-in hybrid. I think I just want my performance car to be a performance car. What about you, James? Yeah, see, I'm normally an advocate for FEVs, and I think <laughs> I'm going to buck the trend a little bit here. I don't, if I was restricted to the Mercedes options, I'd probably look at the 43 as a, as a nice middle point. I think it's the new C-Class is... It's not my favourite, and they've, 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 they've jacked up the prices, the displacement thing is another thing. The, the, in fairness, the C43 was a lot of fun on a winding French back road when I took it out. I had a wagon though, which again, they don't offer here anymore. <laughs> so if they had a wagon, I think I'd be more inclined to be keen on it. But like, you know, even the 43, at the price it's at now, is not that far off like an RS4. And I'd have the RS4 any day, and not to do the you think yeah, going no, to another showroom, yeah. but I think I'd probably go for an RS4. And you know, they, they, there's a bit more, I think those other, the, the BMW and the Audi products that are rivaling this at the moment have a bit more cool factor about them. The C-Class, the C all of them sort of look the same because they're all AMG line, then you get to AMG, and they all have the, they look the, like they have the same bumpers, the interiors are all sort of the same, they offer 50 shades of black in the interior as well. So, you know, unless you're, there is some sort of secret um, personalization program that I don't know about, there's not really a lot of choice. And, you know, I just don't know if I want to spend that much money and just feel like I've got the same car as everyone else. Can I actually say on that though, despite us sort of talking about this, millions of column inches online already spent on this car, there are also plenty of people who just want the best C-Class. They go, I have how much money to spend, I want to show off, what's the best you can give me? And the dealer goes, that's a C63, sir or madam, and they'll say, perfect, I'll have it. So, I mean, there are definitely going to be enthusiast buyers who are, I suppose, looking somewhere else now. But by the same token, I have no doubt this will open AMG up to a new audience. And I also have no doubt that there are plenty of people who just want the best 
And right now, the best that Mercedes does is that plug-in hybrid, so they'll take the plug-in hybrid. I think that's a very good point. I think that with those sort of brands, Mercedes, BMW, Lexus, all those, they are very loyal buyers a lot of the time. So I think that if you buy an old C63, there's a very good chance that your You'll consider the future one. value will lead you straight into a new <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> and I think one more thing to add on that is Mercedes has technically been a pioneer of technology, and that's something that a lot of customers have followed the brand for, this is a huge innovation for them. So I can see that for their customer base, while it's polarizing that, you know, some of the Bogans that first got into an AMG C63, because you know, they got enough money and they could afford something like that, that's what they got. But I think a lot of traditional Mercedes buyers who are really into all of the innovations and all the cool things that Mercedes brings out with each generation, I think this is just another selling point for that. So, you know, I think that plays to that as well. And we'll wait to see whether Lewis Hamilton leaving Mercedes has uh, any effect on its sales. <laughs> uh, Ferrari sales go through the roof. I know uh, Albor is one of our founders is it's very, very sad about it at the moment, but um, he might buy another Ferrari, you never know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to comment on any of the F1 stuff because if you told me to guess last year if Lewis was leaving or not, I would have said you're crazy, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's all right. That's for a whole other podcast. Different po podcast entirely. <laughs> but uh, it is time for our picks of the week. We're nearly at the end. So, James, I'll throw over to you first. What is your pick this week? Um, so I came across this TikTok of Carlos Sainz Jr. making pancakes. I know though that sounds completely random. We're a car podcast. Yeah, James. so he's an F1 driver to be specific. <laughs> but there was, it was just... Loose term. Yeah, yeah, I know. For the <laughs> moment anyway. <laughs> I found it funny though because he did this interview ages ago where I think um, F1 does do these really funny interview segments with all the different drivers. And he did this one segment where he was talking about how he has this awesome recipe for pancakes. And so he overlays this vi vision of him making the recipe that he talks about in his previous interview and I just thought it was funny. So that's my pick for this. So James will be making his Carlos Sainz pancakes next week. I hope so, yeah. yeah that's, that's your task for your homework this week. Figure that out, James. Scott, what's your pick this week? Um, I'm just trying to work out what's so special about Carlos pancake recipe. Um, it's my the pick hair. I think it's Carlos. <laughs> it's Carlos. It's like watching recipe. myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. Um, my pick this week is an Instagrammer called Lexi Limitless. Um, she was the youngest person ever to travel to all 196 countries in the world. I realise there are some countries you can't get to. Mm, so some countries that aren't countries, but let's not. Let's not. This is another <laughs> podcast again. Um, it's a world record that she holds. At the moment, she's in the process of circumnavigating the globe in a Ford Explorer electric car. Um, it's a stick it up pre-production car. It's clearly backed by Ford as well. But she popped up on my Instagram feed over the weekend and some of the stories she has sort of documented of her driving through the developed world and then the less developed world have been really fascinating. Um, none of India's public charging network would work with her car. So she hasn't come to Australia yet, has she? No, she has. Oh, has she? Yeah, yeah so she's done, um, <laughs> she's done some driving in Oz. That was not all that troublesome compared to India, for example. Uh, she also documents going through very remote parts of, um, of Africa. It, it's a really interesting series of bits of content. And I think the fact that it's honest about the fact that electric cars aren't quite ready in certain parts of the world is also refreshing because she's living it and she's showing it. Does she have a diesel generator in the back to charge <laughs> it up? Or just no, so I think India was the first time on her trip that she said she had to use a backup battery. It's a quite a chunky sort of in case of emergency, but it's not a generator, it is still electric powered. Um, I don't know what was powering the power plug she eventually found in India. The I was wager it behind probably <laughs> wasn't clean, but that's beside yeah. the point. Yeah. Uh, my pick this week, Bathurst 12 Hour was run yesterday. Great race. If you haven't watched it, uh, definitely check it out. 9-11 uh, won, which was cool. I know that you're very happy about that, Scott. 9-11 with the number 9-12 on it. Yes, uh, the Grello Porsche, which yes. was very cool. But the really cool thing I found from the weekend was Ford brought out their fully electric super van. Mm. Now, James, I know you're not the biggest fan of the van. But... Oh, look, I think it's cool, but I, you know, they've been posting on Instagram quite a lot about yeah. it going around Sydney Motorsport Park. And yeah. I just got sick of seeing the same barriers. Well, now it's been around Bathurst, which is very, very <laughs> cool in the wet, or damp conditions anyway. Um, but the funny thing was Ford said, oh, we're going to be running three motor set up, you know, 1500 horsepower. And then they sent out a correction to that press release saying, oh, sorry, we're, we're not running three. We're actually going to run all four electric motors. Oh, okay. And do 2000 horsepower. Wow. <laughs> 2000 horsepower out of this fully electric van. They did a massive skid down uh, the front straight of Bathurst and then ran a couple of laps and I think that is just very, very cool. It might be one of the fastest cars ever to go around. Did they ever happens. disclose the time that it did? I don't, I don't recall it, but I think just the power numbers alone are pretty, mm. pretty well. They put that um, 330 kilometer hour skyline to, to the test down Conrad, I imagine. It's, um, 
it's almost as big as that Bentley Continental GT that um, that was running in GT3 racing yep. a couple of years ago. Very similar across the top of the mountain. Yeah, it was no good in the rain either. So. No, it's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Um, I'm actually excited because there's another race at Bathurst this week, isn't there? Yeah, the V8s are there this week. Yeah. Sorry, we're not allowed to call the V8s. The supercars, the supercars. are there this week. Yes. So Bathurst Superfest is this week. So, awesome. Yeah, unfortunately, Newcastle fell over and they're starting the season at Bathurst. I'll leave that up to you whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, but I, I think more Bath is the better. Yeah. But yeah, that'd be cool. James, any final thoughts? No, I think we're just in a really exciting period for, you know, for us, we've got a lot of events coming on at the moment. We've got a lot of new cars that are being released and we're doing all the launch drives and things like that. So it's just a really exciting time for us as journos to be, um, you know, covering cars that people actually care about. Like I was just on the Triton last week. The review goes live on March 1. We um, will talk about it, but we're just not allowed yeah. to at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Uh, we've got a couple of other important cars coming up with the Toyota BZ4X, Subaru Solterra, and less important, the Ionic 5N. But you know, there's some really cool stuff happening at the moment, and just it's, it's really cool to see the industry really coming alive again. So, yeah. Mm. So do you have any questions about uh, any of the new cars that are coming out this year? The guys are happy to answer whatever they can. Uh, and if there's anything specific, we'll keep you up updated week to week what they're going to be driving, what new cars are coming, so that if you have any questions, you can ask and they'll be able to answer it on the podcast. Guys, thanks for joining me once again. Uh, hopefully next week we return to normal operations. Yes. But I, th I think this has worked quite well. I, I quite like the face to face -ness, yeah. that's not a word, of this. It's yeah. nice talking directly to you. Yeah, it's a nice change. What do you guys think? Let us know. Uh, I just looked at the other camera that can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys, thanks for joining me. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Don't forget to uh, subscribe if you're on YouTube. Follow us or download us if you're listening on audio platform and leave us a five-star review because uh, we appreciate it and we think we're pretty awesome. So hopefully you do too. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you next week.